37. As he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. And when the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed that he did not first perform the ritual washing before dinner. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and evil. Fools, didn't he who made the outside make the inside too? But give from what is within you to the poor, and then everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees! You give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb, and you bypass justice and the love of God, and the love for God. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the front seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you! You are like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't know it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. Then he said, Woe also to you experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry. Yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you! You build monuments to the prophets and your fathers killed them. Therefore, you are witnesses that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their monuments. Because of this, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, so that this generation may be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who, per- who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible. Woe to you experts in the law. You have taken away the key of knowledge. You didn't go in yourselves and you hindered those who were going in. When he left, the scribes and Pharisees began to oppose him fiercely and to cross-examine him about many things. They were lying in wait for him to trap him in something he said. May God add his blessing to the reading and now the teaching and preaching of his holy word. May Jesus Christ forever be praised. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is, You Bunch of Hypocrites. You Bunch of Hypocrites. Hypocrisy is something that that I've heard something a little bit about. I've heard from people that I've invited to church before. You probably have heard this as well. People say, well, I'm not going down there to that church because it's full of hypocrites. And the correct response is to tell them, you're absolutely right. And we have room for one more. Please come join us. (laughs) Hypocrisy. We don't like hypocrisy. We don't like someone acting as if they're God's first lieutenant on Sunday when you know how they've acted the rest of the week. Amen? We don't like hypocrisy. We despise hypocrisy. We see it as being dishonest. We see it as being disingenuous. It is a purposeful deception to practice hypocrisy. And so this morning in our text of Scripture... We see Jesus interacting with a group of people who were thought to be righteous. He interacted with this group of people that the the regular public, the observing public around them, thought this group of people called the Pharisees, that they must be greatly righteous. They are surely holy people. And Jesus begins to expose them as hypocrites. As Jesus reveals the hypocrisy of these super-religious people of His day. This morning, in our day, let us examine our own lives for where hypocrisy may dwell in us. We began this morning, number one, in verses 37 through 41, by seeing the hypocrisy of outward appearances. Jesus is invited to this meal, to this banquet by a Pharisee. 
And they sit down to the meal, and Jesus begins eating. And the Pharisee is just absolutely shocked because Jesus did not practice the things that the Pharisees were practicing. You see, the Pharisees had all of these rules and all of these regulations. They had ritual ceremonial washings. So uh, it, it really had nothing to do with cleanliness. They, they were just doing it as a ceremony. So it's time to eat. Hear the ceremonial washing of the hands and say something about the washing of the hands. And picking up of the utensil, let's have the ceremonial washing of the utensil before we use the utensil. And, you know, if... If they were around today, they would have the ceremonial washing of your car keys before you used your car keys. They just had all of these ceremonies and all of these rituals that they used that made them stand out among the other people. These were public rituals. They wanted people to see them doing all of these things so that people would think that they were better than them. So much of hypocrisy is about that, isn't it? Uh, The person who wants you to think, well, I'm better than you. I'm more holy than you. I'm God's first lieutenant. But whenever you really examine their lives, you see that their lives are full of dead men's bones. A hypocrite. A hypocrite is concerned about the outward appearances. Pharisees were concerned about how other Pharisees saw them. I mean, that's who they were around most of the time. And the the Pharisees were always trying to outdo one another. And the Pharisees were concerned about how the general public saw them. That's what hypocrites do. Hypocrites are concerned about the outward appearances. But folks, let me tell you this morning, do you know that God looks at the heart? As a matter of fact, we're told in 1 Samuel 16, 7, when, Jesse, uh, that when Jesse's sons had all presented themselves before the prophet Samuel to see who the next king of Israel would be. Samuel the prophet went through all of Jesse's sons and the Lord did not say, the Lord said that none of these will be my man. And Samuel asked Jesse, don't you have any other sons? And it was the little shepherd boy, David, the, the little kid. And he was out tending the sheep, and they brought in the little shepherd boy, David. And the Lord told Samuel, he is the one. The Lord said, do not look at the outward appearance. For God does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. Here's the point, folks. You may cover the outward appearance with this exterior. You may cover the outward appearance with paint or veneer. You may have your insides hidden where people can't see what's deep in your heart. You don't want anybody to know what's going on deep in your life. But I want to tell you today that God sees it. His eyes pierce through all of the trappings. God's eyes pierce through all of the hypocrisy. And God's eyes see what's on the inside. Hypocrites. Hypocrites try to hide what's on the inside. Hypocrites are concerned with what people see on the outside. But God looks at the heart. The hypocrisy of outward appearances. Then there's the hypocrisy of public perception, verses 42 through 44. Look again at the text. Jesus says to them, But woe to you Pharisees! You give a tenth of mint and rue and every kind of herb, and you bypass justice and the love for God. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the front seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you! You are like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't even know it. Not only the hypocrisy of the outside, but the, of the outside appearance, but the hypocrisy of the public perception. Hypocrites want people to know that they are holy. Hypocrites want people to know that they have perfect attendance in Sunday school. Hypocrites want people to know that they're special. Hypocrites want people to pat them on the back. Hypocrites want people to recognize them. Hypocrites want people to compliment them. Hypocrites want people to, to bring them up to the front and seat them in the seat of honor. Hypocrites want people to see their righteousness. 
And Jesus was talking here to the bunch of Pharisees. And the Pharisees were experts at being recognized. Pharisees were experts at getting attention. When they gave their offerings, they had the one place they gave their offering in the temple. And you have to have a little bit of historical background here. In the temple, the place where you would give your offering would be this great big metal funnel. Maybe we need to get one of those. This great big metal funnel, and it would go in, the funnel would be on the outside, and it would funnel into the inside, into where the treasury box was. And you would go by, and you would put your offering into the great big funnel, and it would go into the treasury box. Well, what the Pharisees would do is the Pharisee maybe. Um, maybe he made $800 that week, and so he made $800, and his tithe would be $80. So instead of going and putting in $81 coins, he would go down to the, the first bank of Jerusalem, and he would trade out $80 coins for... Now, they, they didn't have dollar denominations, that kind of thing, so I'm just having to give it to you in modern language. Instead of, okay, instead of having four $20 bills... He goes down to the bank and he says, Can you change these four $20 bills for me into, into dimes? Or better yet, into quarters and dimes. And so, yes, so the bank gives him $80 in quarters and dimes. And then he waits until there's a big crowd in the temple. And he waits until there's a long line that's forming at the big funnels. He waits until lots of people are around. And then he carries his money bag, jingling, shaking it as he's going. And he goes up to the great big funnel and he starts to pour in his offering, his tithe for the week. Shake it in a little bit. Shake it in a little bit, a little bit. And what's it doing the whole time? It's clanging, right? And it's making a big racket. And when it makes a big racket and the racket keeps on. It, the racket continues. People began to turn and look and see, oh my, who is putting in so much money? Who is putting in such a big offering? And that Pharisee, that's just what he wanted. He wants people to see him, to hear him putting in an offering. He wants the public attention. But do you know what that Pharisee's hypocrisy did? Because the Pharisee was a hypocrite. Because of his hypocrisy, he lost his reward. Because he wanted the attention and the approval of men, he lost his reward from God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, If you do your good deeds to be seen by men, then you get no reward from God. Who would you rather to reward you, men or God? When y'all make up your mind, let me know. Who had you rather reward you, men or God? God. But the Pharisee wanted the pat on the back. The Pharisee wanted the attention. The Pharisee wanted people to look at him and say, Oh my, how generous he is. In verse 42, Jesus said, You ought to tithe. He said, You should have done this without neglecting the other things. Jesus said, You should have tithed. You were doing the right thing, but you need to pay attention to justice and the love for God. You need to take care of the poor. You need to be doing all these other things that maybe you won't get recognized for. You should have done, you should have tithed, but you should have done the other things as well. The hypocrisy of public perception. And then number three, the hypocrisy of government power. Oh my. Look with me at, uh, at verse 45. Jesus, Jesus has blasted these Pharisees. Woe to you Pharisees! Woe to you bunch of hypocrites! And so there's some other people at that dinner party, and there's a bunch of lawyers there. Very esteemed gathering of people, right? So one of the, verse 45, one of the experts in the law answered and said, Teacher... When you say those things, you're insulting us too. He said, teacher, I'm offended. He said, Jesus, 
You ought not say that. That hurts my feelings. And so Jesus, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I take it all back. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want you to feel good about yourself. No, Jesus said, verse 46, then He said, Woe also to you experts in the law. He said, you think I hurt your feelings by telling the Pharisees that? Wait till you hear what I've got to tell you. Woe to you experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry and you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. Is there anything worse than government officials who make rules and laws for us and don't follow them themselves? That's what these experts in the law. That's what these scribes, these Jewish lawyers had been doing. They constantly made up more rules and more regulations and more laws and made them more complicated. That's what the lawyers were doing back then. Hadn't changed much today, have they? Constantly adding to, making more complicated because I I believe they had to justify their jobs. That's what bureaucrats do. Bureaucrats make more rules because the more rules you you have, the more bureaucrats you have to have to enforce the rules. And more taxes you have to collect to pay the bureaucrats to enforce the rules. They had to justify their jobs so they made more rules and made them more complicated. And and they 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 said they had a religious reason for this. They said, well, here's the Ten Commandments. These are the rules that God gave us. And so we want to really make sure that nobody breaks the Ten Commandments. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a hedge around the Ten Commandments. We're going to make a bunch of rules that relate to the Ten Commandments that will keep you from getting close to breaking the Ten Commandments. And then over a period of years, those rules that they made around the Ten Commandments uh, weren't enough, and so they made more rules. And the circle just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The rules they make in concentric circles, more and more rules, more and more regulations, more and more writings, more and more laws. And that means there have to be more and more scribes and experts in the law to keep up with them. The hypocrisy of government power, power that is enforced on us. You see, here's what these scribes and experts in the law did. They they wrote loopholes so that they didn't apply to them. Does that sound familiar? Sort of like passing Obamacare but Congress doesn't have to buy into it. Did you know that the IRS, that the IRS agents owe millions and millions in back taxes themselves? Now what happens if me and you owe back taxes? And did you know that there are 1,150 IRS agents that owe back taxes that received over a million dollars in bonuses last year? What do you call that? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. You've got to follow these rules. You've got to follow these regulations. If you don't pay your taxes, we're going to attach your wages. If you don't pay your taxes, we're going to put you in jail. Well, excuse me, sir, are you paying your taxes? Well, that's none of your business. The hypocrisy of government power. But folks, I take great comfort in knowing that Jesus said there's going to be a judgment one day for those who do this. This isn't political. This is just what Jesus said. He said to them, woe to you. Woe to you who do this. This generation will be held responsible, verse 51. Verse 52, woe to you experts in the law. You've taken away the key of knowledge. You didn't didn't go in yourselves and you hindered those who are going in. He says there's coming a day of judgment where these people are going to be held responsible. Is there anybody here this morning like me who hates hypocrisy? Do you hate hypocrisy? God hates it even more. And the hypocrites, the religious hypocrites, the public hypocrites, the government hypocrites, one day, according to the Word of God, are all going to be held responsible. 
I hate hypocrisy as much as you do. But folks, do you know there are, there are some forms of hypocrisy that are more dangerous than others. You say, well, that hypocrisy at the IRS is pretty dangerous to my pocketbook. There's a more dangerous hypocrisy even than that. That is the hypocrisy of looking like a Christian on the outside. Looking on the outside like you've been saved. Acting on the outside like you've been born again. But on the inside, you're as lost as a goose. That's the most dangerous hypocrisy. The most dangerous hypocrisy is having everybody in this church thinking that you're a Christian. Having the pastor think you're a Christian. Having your mom and daddy think you're a Christian. Having your spouse and children think that you're a Christian. But on the inside, you know that you are lost. That's the most dangerous hypocrisy. The most dangerous hypocrisy is as Jesus told the Pharisees, He said, you're you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they're beautiful. But on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones. Friends, the most dangerous thing in the world for a person is to be like Jesus said the Pharisees and their cups and their plates. You wash the outside of it, but you haven't done anything about what's on the inside of it. Folks, it doesn't matter who thinks you're a Christian. It doesn't matter who thinks that you're saved. It doesn't matter who thinks that you're born again if on the inside God knows that you're not. Because I can't save you and this church can't save you and no amount of washing the outside of the cup can save you. You've got to deal with what's on the inside. And only God through His Son Jesus Christ can do that and thank God He did. The Bible says that all of us are sinners. So before we come to Christ, we are all full of sin. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm better than probably 90% of people. I, I, I try to do good. Friends, that stuff is on the outside. Until you deal with what's on the inside, you are not saved. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. The Bible says the cost of sin is death. And so those who meet their Maker without ever having been saved are going not only into physical death, but they are going into eternal death, separation from God forever in hell. The Bible says, though, not only is the cost of sin death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the Bible says. And friends, I want to tell you this morning, if you've got everybody fooled, if you've got everybody in this church fooled, if you've got everybody in your family fooled, if you have everybody at your workplace fooled, if you have everybody who's in your neighborhood fooled, but you know on the inside that you are not saved, you've never been born again, I promise you that one day you'll find out that you didn't fool God. The the worst hypocrisy, the most dangerous hypocrisy is the hypocrisy of the soul. So what do you do about it? Today, today, you repent of your sins. You call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. Today, you walk down this aisle in this invitation and you give your heart to Jesus and you surrender to Him as Lord. I tell you this today, Jesus is Lord. You are, you are either living in surrender to His Lordship or in rebellion against it. Are you saved? Have you been born again? Today is the day for that. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that this message has gone forth with power and conviction. I pray that folks have heard it and now will respond in faith. Lord, I pray for every decision that needs to be made. I pray for those that need to come down to the altar. I pray for those who need to really be saved today. I pray that they won't let anything stop them. I pray they won't care what anyone else may think. I pray they get it right today. 
Lord, for those that need to join this church by letter or baptism or statement, we pray for them to have that boldness. Lord, for the hurting one whose heart is broken, we pray for their healing and restoration today. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people say...